Welcome back to the Shy Within podcast. Amanda McCoy Flanagan, a native New Yorker turned Coloradan, master, masterfully combines urban insights with a nature inspired philosophy in her approach to love and loss. An award winning author and motivational speaker, she recently launched her first inspirational memoir, Trust Yourself to Be All In, Safe to Let Go safe to love and let go, and now co-host the Soul Rising podcast. As a co-founder of Castle Rock Clubhouse, she supports sobriety and spirituality initiatives through her nonprofit work. A multifaceted enthusiast of horses, drumming, running, vegan cuisine, and rock music, Amanda lives her passions out loud. Wow, Amanda. <laughs> and let me just repeat her, the title of her book one more time. It's Trust Yourself to Be All In, Safe to Love and Let Go. <laughs> I want to make it. sure the audience got that right. <laughs> thank that you. Right. Yeah. Yep. So thank you so much for being on my show today. I'm really excited to talk with you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. We booked this a long time ago, so I've been waiting a while to speak with you, and this is going to be awesome. I love the name of your podcast, Shine Within. You do shine. I can see <laughs> that immediately. It is perfect for you. So thank you so much for having me. No, I'm excited, too. Thank you. Um, so, Amanda, your journey begins with a profound, profound personal loss. Uh, could you actually go ahead and share the passing of your brother and how it has influenced your path towards emotional healing and self-discovery? So my loss actually began um, back in 2007. I was sober for about eight months. And my boyfriend at the time, who also got sober about the same week that I did, um, he didn't wake up on Easter Sunday. He died from an overdose oh, and goodness. complications with di diabetes. And I never really addressed it. I thought I did. Um, I thought I grieved. I cried for a little bit. And then I kind of just moved on um, <clears throat> and met my husband. We had a couple of beautiful children. We moved from New York out to Colorado, like you said in my in my bio. And um, and everybody started dying. It was really crazy. And I was already really in a deep space of grief because I had left New York, my home for 35 years. And I had a complete loss of identity. I didn't know who I was. Um, I had no idea that so much of my identity was wrapped up in being a New Yorker. And just a fam familiarity of all the places, the people, just even just like shopping, like just the streets, just knowing where you're driving, you know, just like just being comfortable in a place. And then I'm put into this complete different place in Colorado, which is like culture shock from New York. Um, and we were, we wanted it. We were ready for a slower sort of lifestyle and everything, but, um, I, and I never questioned moving, but it just brought up a lot. So about a month after we moved here, my, my aunt died, um, my brother's godmother, my aunt Louise. And then within like two years, two and a half years of, after that, my other aunt passed away, my mother's first cousin and my my favorite cousin, my my cousin that I was the closest to at that time. Um, so she was just cool. I just loved her, my cousin Kim, and um, older than me, about 11 years older than me, and I was looked up to her. And uh, we both were sober together for a little while. She also died drug-related. Drug um, and then four months after that, my brother overdosed and died as well. So I've had plenty of loss and plenty of grief. However, I did not deal with any of my grief, really, I, I guess I thought I did. I mean, I was in therapy here and there. I was working. I'm in, I'm in 12 step recovery. I was working my program. I was talking to people. I was, you know, writing, journaling. I was doing my steps. I was self reflecting. You know, I thought I was um, processing things, but turns out I really wasn't. Or not that I wasn't, I just didn't know what I didn't know. Like I, I say that all the time. You don't know what you don't know until you know it. And things have to come up, right? Things have to surface. I have to peel one layer of healing before the next is revealed. And when my brother died, it just put all that other grief right here, like right front and center where for those really, I guess, uh, 11 years or so, I had kind of just been pushing it down and stuffing it without realizing. The biggest kicker to all of this is it's not even just that the grief caught up with me. It was what it created, what how it opened up my eyes to this, what I call the great myth, this generational family dysfunction, this message that was passed down through centuries, I'm sure, in order to try to protect me with, with good intention. However, what the message was, was protect your heart, always love a little bit less so that when somebody leaves you, because the world is not safe, people are not safe, everybody leaves you, everybody hurts you. When that happens, it's not going to hurt as badly. You're not going to be as devastated. Um, so when my brother died, that kind of unconscious belief that was in there 
came out sideways and I uh, pushed my husband away. My husband's 12 years older than me. He's a 9-11 first responder. Um, I, my brain, again, unconsciously, basically said, Amanda, you're never going to have to feel the pain again like you did when your brother died. I, mean, I was in bed for three months. All I could do was take a shower, um, go to my meetings and my recovery meetings and cry, really, and lay in bed. Like I just was down for the count. My husband took care of my kids. My children's survival was, in my mind, threatened. So I was never going to let that happen again, but I didn't realize this was all under the surface. So we went to marriage counseling and she helped me and individual counseling. And my husband also has PTSD. So he did his work. I did my work. We did work together. It takes both parties. If uh, you're facing some marriage difficulties, both parties have to be all in. And um, she really helped to show me to sort of unravel or um, reveal this this limiting belief system, really, that I had been carrying for 38 years and had no idea. I was in fear of true connection, true emotional intimacy. And uh, what that did was put this kind of shield up between my husband and I. And I needed more after my brother died. I just, I needed to be able to like really connect and reach him and feel safe and feel vul and be able to be vulnerable. Um, and it wasn't that he wasn't offering that to me. He was. I mean, his PTSD definitely affected. We both had anxiety, stuff like that. But, um, but it, it was. It was. I just. I was resistant. I just. I couldn't do it. I couldn't step into that safe place where I um, could just let him comfort me and and all that. Because if I got too close and then he dies, here I am again, devastated again. So it was like this. I was in a real kind of crazy space. Um, for a while, um, I wasn't necessarily like here. And I, of course, was not not in the afterlife, but I was in some strange place. I was becoming extremely spiritual. Um, and I really found myself in that healing. That's the beauty of all of this is that I found at the end of uh, the oh, I'm still journeying. Of course, it's never over. But at the culmination of therapy and, and all this, we, I, I really was able to find this unconditional self-worth, unconditional self-love that may waver at times depending on my mood, my circumstances, life, whatever, but it's like unshakable. It's unbreakable. It's like this foundation that I can always go back to. It's always there once that circumstance or whatever kind of passes where I'm doubting myself or I'm caught back in these limiting beliefs or fear. I have the tools that put me back into that good place, back into that self-worth, that self-love. And it's through finding connection with my higher power, spirit, God, universe, source, whatever you want to call it. It's it's this knowing that I truly am never alone and that this force, this beautiful force, this beautiful energy loves me so unconditionally and wants all the goodness and the best for me and that I deserve. I actually have a duty to step into that. I have a duty to shine. I have a duty to go out in the world and do the work that I do, which is help other people heal their grief as well by facing these limiting beliefs and recreating a new story. Actually remembering the old story, remembering who you truly were when you were born um, or in the in between, in the afterlife, I believe in reincarnation, before you came back. We are that. We come back here like that and then life and people and whatever have their way with us and and we start to believe things we start to apply these layers to us that really my whole process and my healing was just just peeling those layers back and getting to my true base naked if you will sort of um just light just light and like allowing that to just come forward um and know and know and trust that that's always there for me whenever i need it Yes, there's so many things I can go branch off of because everything you said is 100% true. And I've experienced that too. My condolences for your loss is Thank that you've you. had in the past. And I can't only imagine losing a brother. I actually lost my cousin just about a couple of weeks ago, maybe two and a half weeks ago. And it, no one wants to say, but I think it could have been a potential overdose. Mm. Um, so I wouldn't having a lot of grief. I lost, lost my uncle too. And then we lost another family member. So this whole month has just been lost, lost, lost. Mm -hmm. And then me having to, I was just sharing with you that I had to do a talk and me having to 
pray constantly to my higher power, you know, like you say, God source, whatever the God mm -hmm. of your understanding is. Um, mm -hmm. So mine is my inner self and also the frequency of love out there. Um, I really felt like I wasn't alone. I, I felt like, oh, I can't do this. You know, all those limited beliefs started coming back. I'm like, I, wait, I don't have these. I, I thought I got rid of these, but you know, I'm a human being here on earth. I still suffer. Uh, just because I did heal myself, I'm still healing myself. It doesn't mean that I'm going to not suffer. And so it is hard having to lose loved ones. And I can completely have empathy of exactly what you have gone through. Cause I'm going through that actually right now. Like I was just like, what? cause I was really close to my cousin. Like his, aunt, his mom is my aunt. She practically mm -hmm. raised me. So he was like my older brother in a way. Yeah. Yeah. But so, but thank you so much for sharing that though. And you're absolutely right. You know, we're not alone. We are absolutely yeah. not alone. And every time that we feel like we are alone, we really need to seek help. And that was one of my biggest things for me is uh, part of my self-growth is I was very, I felt like uh, um, asking for help was a sign of weakness before, um, but it's such a big sign of strength. And when I ask for help, you will get whatever you need help and you will get it. And yes. trust me, it, it'll, it'll be all good. Just keep going. And everybody's journey is different. And I know all of our listeners are either on a, a path of sobriety or they're sober curious, or they just want to improve in their life, you know? So mm -hmm. this message goes out for anybody, really, especially when it comes to shining and shining within. Yes. Now in your memoir, you actually do talk about shining the emotional armor as mm -hmm. a response to pain. Um, can you go ahead and elaborate on what that armor looked like for you and, and, and how it impacted your relationships? Sure. My armor was just, it was, it was very insidious because like my friends, after I went through this whole journey, this healing process, they would say, but we never felt like you, you know, had a problem being close or connecting or anything like that. And I, I, I wore a really good facade, you know, being the alcoholic that I am, many of us are chameleons, right? We do and say, I did and said and acted and dressed and whatever the way that I thought you wanted me to or whatever group I was hanging out with at the time. You know, I always had a million different groups of friends and I would kind of shape shift into like whatever you wanted me to be. Um, so I, I, you know, was able to have friends and I was close with friends, but it was more on the romantic side of things. Um, and the same thing, it was like when I met my husband, and I think a lot of us do this when we, when we meet a potential new partner, um, I sort of, I don't know if I pretended to like the things he did or to be like more adventurous or more exciting or whatever so that he would like me more and fall in love with me um, because ultimately all I wanted was to be wanted. I just wanted to be loved. So again, I would do and say and be whatever you wanted me to be so that you would approve of me and that you would like me and, val and validate me. Um, and what I learned was that armor was sort of that, that, pre that pretense that like, I, you know, I'm, I am this, I am that when that really truly wasn't me. It was just me doing, you know, acting in, in ways to get your approval. Um, so it was this fear, this, this, this emotional intimacy, like I mentioned before that, like I could not step into because I had this armor on, right? Like if you think about it, you have this like heavy suit on and it's stiff and like you can't get out of it you can't get through it to really connect on a deep true meaningful vulnerable level with somebody well I couldn't I should keep it in the eye with my with my armor on and um it kept me safe it really it, it, it kept me safe until it didn't anymore until it was more uncomfortable until I write, it was almost like my brother, I truly believe from spirit in spirit, like pushed me and compelled me to like break through it, like get out of this. I, I had said in my book, I think I took this part out, but he was like the oil can, like Jeremy's spirit was the oil can that like loosened up my once immovable parts, you know? So I started to like live, like really truly live in divine connection with um my essence and who i need to be and, and who i truly am i just started to feel my purpose i started to feel my meaning and i couldn't do that while i was still wearing this armor it just wouldn't work but i had no way of getting out of it i didn't know how to get out of it and i think so many of us stay stuck in these places because we don't know a path forward so it's really super scary like if i let go of this thing then what 
then who am I? Then I'm exposed. Then I'm whatever, right? So we need something to replace it. So once I went to therapy and she kind of laid out this path forward for me and made me feel safe enough to start shedding that armor and getting, you know, standing truly in my, in my, in my true self. Um, and then it was that self-love and that self-worth that gave me that, um, well, first I had motivation because I, I knew it. I knew, I knew, you know, but, and she was great. My therapist was awesome. She helped me so much. She motivated me so much. She was like my biggest cheerleader, but I saw other people, especially in recovery, in the rooms of recovery that had gone through some seriously painful things and that they came out the other side, not just stronger, but like wiser and just more real, more real. Like I've just always felt like something was missing in my life. I always felt like there was like this like lie or, something just wasn't right. And I was able to, by stepping out of that armor to really step into my true self, my true purpose. And that all comes again with that, that self-worth and that self-love that I'm safe no matter what. Yes, life is going to happen. And I'm very sorry for your losses as well. Like you, like you said, like we're going to suffer, you know, life is going to happen. Things are going to happen that are going to bring feelings up, maybe sometimes out of nowhere that we don't even know that are in there, but we have to be willing to, meet those feelings or be open to whatever's going to come up because it's going to teach us and it's going to bring us to the next a spiritual level, ascension, emotional evolution, whatever you want to call it. That's going to then make you even more comfortable in your own skin, know yourself even more, and then really feel that compulsion to go out in the world and do what we're all supposed to be doing. My whole journey and everything that I talk about in my book and my podcast, the whole mission here is to heal our own personal energy so that we can help heal the collective. It all was born after COVID. It all was born after this severe division. And I had had these three years of healing basically before I started to write my book. And the book again was, that was a divine inspiration. I did not say, oh, I'm going to sit down and write a book. That was like, I need to help the world somehow. Spirit, tell me what's the best way to do it. And I was running one day and I just heard, you're going to write a book. And I was like, oh, okay. And then it just flowed. Oh my gosh. It, I don't know if you've written a book, but it it just flowed right through me. Um, that divine inspiration. Um, yeah. So Beautiful. it just, it just, it just, it just comes when I'm open. It just comes. And then I can go out and do the work that I'm meant to do. Wow. Yes. I'm actually in the process of writing a book. I, huh? I've taken a pause from it because of me and preparations for this, whatever I was, the project that I was working on before, but now I'm going to get back into it and I'm excited. Thanks. And yes, I will be asking the divine source, like, please help me and guide me into writing my truth into whatever I'm supposed to be writing in this book. So it can not only help myself because it's going to help me. Sure. As well. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yep, it's very healing. But to help others that are going through the similar similar circumstances that I have gone through in my past, you know, and yeah. it, like I said, the journey inward is so much more important than the journey outward. When you shine within, then you'll start shining without and then everyone will see it and then they will want to know, hey, how do I find my purpose? And that's where it's like a ripple effect and it goes on and on and on, helping with the collective human consciousness, which is a beautiful thing because we are all one. Yes, And I always have to remind people, we are one. Like, it was funny, my husband. So we're laying down in bed at night and we're about to go to bed. And I was just sharing with him and we we're talking. And then he scratched on like his head. And at the same time, I scratched on my leg. We, I didn't pay attention. Oh, he's, oh, you got you scratched at the same time. He said, hey, it's because we're one. We're doing the same thing. Oh. <laughs> I, like, I love that. Things. They're so funny. And he's funny because like the lingo that I use with him, he's because he's, he's not an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer. Uh-huh. Um, and so he's very logical. Uh-huh. Yep, and yep, so he's yep. starting to get into, I mean, he loves God, no matter what, he's a godly sure. man. But like, when it comes to all like the, the woo, I guess, it would uh -huh, say, uh -huh, he's yep. like, sure, Gina, whatever, Gina, <laughs> but he's getting it. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. That's great. Oh, my goodness. Um, But you've spent a decade on the 12 step recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, how did this go ahead? How did this framework go ahead and support you in your journey? And what, and at what point did you realize that it wasn't enough to save you from yourself? Yeah. So it was wild because I was nine years sober when I moved out to Colorado and kind of hit, I've had three emotional bottoms in recovery that I've not had to drink over any of them. The first one was when Mike died, my boyfriend, when I was eight months sober. And they, so they're all kind of around grief. This is why I think grief and loss is so huge to be talking about because I, I think a lot of our 
problems within our discomfort or our relationship problems are stemming from our inability to cope with loss. We kind of, we don't like it, right? We only want to feel good all the time. Humans just want to feel good all the time. But like you said, we can't. Um, and then I moved out to Colorado nine years sober. And again, like I had been in therapy before that, like I had been doing the work and I just hit that other bottom. And that was when I really went into my 11th step meditation. My sponsor out here at the time, she said, are you doing a 10, proper 10 and proper 11th step? And I was like, eh, not really, you know, 10 is taking inventory. Like I would do that spot check. I thought like I was so in tune and intuitive that like I just knew and I, I do I do I definitely know I can do that spot check inventory we talk about you know and I know what, what I'm feeling but um something about having a process to it I didn't want to do that at night because I um they recommend to do it at night but I, if I know I have to make amends or if I know something's not right I want to be able to address it that's probably my anxiety I won't be able to sleep well knowing that like oh my gosh I'm gonna have to have this conversation tomorrow I'd rather have it like right now if the other party is open to that. But, um, and then the 11th step that I wasn't doing really well. So, so the 10th step, not doing the 10th step very well, I wasn't really truly being honest with myself about how I was operating. And perhaps if I were, I would have been able to see some things a little bit more clearly before they just came up and smacked me right in the face. 11, uh, the meditation I hadn't been doing either. I tried, I tried through those first nine years. You know, my sponsor in New York, she would say, just while the coffee's dropping, like literally like three minutes, like just sit down and try. And it was, I had this idea that meditation had to look a certain way. I really had it on this like pedestal that like yoginis and like all these gurus and all these people, like monks, like I, that I had to be in this really highly elevated place, you know, and that's not the truth at all. That's not, that's not that some people can meditate like that, but there's just all different types. So, um, when I was at that emotional bottom, she said, you really need to meditate, meditate, meditate. She drilled that into me. So every morning I'd get up at about 5.30 in the morning. My kids were little, so they were waking up early and it would be dark and I'd go into the kitchen, I'd light a candle and I'd have a couple of like daily readers or whatever to start getting my, my mind going. And I just kind of was like, okay, where are you? Like, what is this thing? You know? And I just sat and sat and I just waited. And all of a sudden I saw in my mind's eye, this like, figure. And I don't know what it is. I used to think it was like the spirit of Jesus, but, and I'm, I'm not religious, but I just felt that it was, it was him. Um, now I think maybe it was Mary, Mary Magdalene, not even mother Mary. Now I think it was maybe a female energy, whatever it was. I didn't, couldn't see its attributes, but, um, it was just this like figure, but it was like a rounded figure. Like I knew it was the shape of like a person. And it just walked out of the darkness and put its hands out like this and just gave me these beautiful beams of light, like this, like yellowish whitish amber, I guess you could call it like glow that just like went out from them and went right into here. And I realized I had this big void still this big hole in the soul. And they filled it for me with this light. And of course, I had to be willing to receive it. I had to be open enough to receive it, right? It's. I think people sometimes think that like if we pray, that like something's just going to happen by like osmosis or like some kind of like miracle. And yes, miracles happen. But I believe my higher power speaks to me, tells me what to do, tells me what action to take, tells me where to put the footwork in, right? So it's a, it's a partnership. Mm -hmm. And then, so then again, now three years later, my brother dies and I'm 12 years sober at this point. And I hit this crazy, this crazy bottom, which turned out to be the best blessing ever because I believe I'm healing generations. They say we heal seven generations back, seven generations forward. I believe I'm healing like a ton of generational dysfunction for my family, which again, well, dysfunction comes with a negative connotation. But it was, it served them well. And I think it was well-meaning. We just, our society's shifting. Things are shifting so much. We don't need that anymore. We're different. We've changed. We've evolved as, as humans. Um, so the 12 steps helped me so much through that because my sponsor here at the time was like, why don't we go through your steps specifically around your marriage? And that's what I, and that's what I did. I met with her. And then we went through the traditions as the 12 traditions as well. And I went through the traditions and how that relates to my outside world and my relationships on the whole. And so by doing the steps and the traditions around my relationships and specifically my marriage, 
I was just able to see all this fear that I was holding on to. And that's the point of the steps is in that fourth step, you get to your fears and your, I don't like the word character defects. I actually am starting to have trouble with some of the semantics, some of the language in 12 step recovery. Um, so I kind of take what I need and leave the rest because ultimately it helps me a lot. Um, but um, I call them survival traits. I learned that from a different 12 step program. That it's, that it's things that I needed to employ or use um, when I was a child to basically survive emotionally. My parents didn't physically abandon me. They weren't abusive, I guess, by today's standards, maybe it would have been, but for the time it was, it was pretty normal. Um, it was more of a, um, you know, dismissive or sort of um, devaluing or just not, uh, you know, un not, val not validating. So it was more emotional wounds. Um, and I was able to like see that those survival traits were really driving so much. It's all of this, you know, not being wanted or not feeling loved. I think that's at the heart of so much. And I also think that happens naturally just, just by the nature of child rearing and, and, and raising children and being a child, um, it just, you know, when you're left to sort of fend for yourself on some things, like I had to leave my daughter at preschool, three years old, hysterical crying for like, Literally, she cried probably like hysterically for like a month. And then it got to just whimpering, standing at the door with her, you know, and it's like, and the teachers would tell me, you just have to go. You just, you have to leave. And I'd go and sit in my car and I'd be like, should I go in? Should I get her? Should I not? Is she going to feel abandoned? Mm -hmm. So most of my healing is around this. It's called emotional abandonment. Um, but I didn't and because I know that just part of her independence and learning to be self-sufficient and learning to trust in her own self to be able to show up that I cannot save her time and time again, you know, and I need to allow my children to find that strength within to stand on their own two feet. That's, I believe, the point of parenting. I'm not going to be here forever. And I'm stealing things from them. I'm stealing their lessons if I'm constantly coming to the rescue. Um, so I was able to see that I was um, functioning from a lot of that, um, my, my own emotional abandonment. And so I had to give it to myself with my higher power. That's the crux of my healing is I will never abandon myself. If and when my husband dies, like I said, he's 12 years older than me. Listen, anything can happen. Where's wood? I can't even find any wood out here. I want to knock on wood, but anything can happen. Um, but if it goes, you know, typically um, I will probably be about 70 ish if he even lives that long. So I need to know that like, I will be okay. I, I, I will not self-abandon. I will get up off the floor. I'm not saying I'm going to be skipping through the daisies when this pain comes, but I will get up off the floor at some point because I'll probably end up there again because of my history tells me that. Uh, and I like we have people that support us. I know the professionals to go to. My friends, again, my higher power. And then just myself, my higher self. I got to tell you, talk about your connection is, I don't know what exact words you use, but sort of like your inner, your inner self, your inner guidance, right? I have that. That's never going to go away, but I had to meet it and I had to know it and I had to learn to trust it. And that's what my journey was all about. Wow. Yes. I I think everyone's experienced those bathroom floor cries, whatever mm -hmm. they've going through, you know, and you know, sometimes we just have to cry and actually helps me feel much better though. I really suppressed all of my emotions before mm. and I never let it out and it wasn't until I started finally getting those ugly cries out that I started feeling better I needed those cries because that's what mm. helped me in the long run yes but uh in my spiritual journey recovery journey it's all the same it's all connected yes it is uh, <laughs> what I noticed is so I started getting clear-headed more clarity as soon as I stopped drinking right away you know I started working out taking care of my body first Mm -hmm. Going to Orange Theory, 5 a.m., you know, I didn't have my kids with me at the time because of the circumstances I was in. And it was just better for me to be by myself, recover, and uh -huh. then go from there. Uh -huh. yeah. And so it was just me and myself and I and God. <laughs> and yeah. I was literally, literally in a little studio. And I remember just getting better and better and better. I sought out a mentor who was not a fitness expert only, but she was also a mindset coach. So I really, she really helped me in my limiting beliefs and just reframing my mindset and just thinking mm -hmm. differently around this world mm -hmm. and deprogramming myself. Sure. When 2020 hit, I kid you not, that moment of pause. And then this is going to sound kind of crazy. When my husband 
when I was driving on the freeway, my husband called me. He said, yeah, you know, they're closing down our, our work building. It, this I was being sent home. And I had this smile on my face. Like I just knew something major, massive. There's going to be a massive shift here on earth. And me I too. Not you did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, you just had that knowing, right? And I, and I'm like, I don't know why I'm happy right now. This is like oh, supposed to be like a horrible time. And I lost family uncles due to COVID. Um, so they say, you know, who knows? Yeah. Uh, that's another podcast. Yes. Um, and so I, I, I was like, oh my gosh, something's going to change. And this was my spiritual waking was in 2020, clear vision. My eyes opened up. I was researching, learning all these different things. And I'm like, wow, I got so connected with God then. It was just an incredible experience. I wanted to go ask you about your own personal spiritual waking um, and how that seems to be like a pivotal moment in your life. Can you share some experiences that you've gone through and what changes or shifts you noticed in your life? Sure. I mean, my first spiritual awakening was was getting sober. That was I was basically tomorrow's my actual my my anniversary. Tomorrow, happy birthday! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, of um eighteen years tomorrow. Wow, wow. And I, I remember just like laying in bed after drinking. I don't know a day and a half. I think it was like twenty eight hours. Like I was, I was. I'm a true alcoholic. Like when I drink, it shifts something in my chemicals. I wake up. It gives me energy, and I don't pass out. Like most normal people pass out. I don't pass out. It's really wild. So I'm laying in bed after this, you know, uh, night of drinking, day and a half of drinking. And I just had this moment of clarity where I heard the voice of the divine or whatever say to me, you're going to die or you're going to kill somebody else if you don't stop drinking because I would drive around in blackouts. I would just, and I'm not proud of it. And I have friends who have killed people. And I'm not proud of it at all, but that was my MO. That's 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 what I would do. Um, and I just knew it was over. It was this really crazy, like you said, just knowing about COVID. Like I get these knowings, these deep, deep, deep knowings like you. And I just knew it was over, but I didn't know if I would stay stopped without a recovery program. And I I knew about 12-step recovery and I I went and, and I did that. And I just had these like little mini awakenings. Um like after that and then leading up well before that actually i had these little small for like a month and a half before i got sober i had these moments of cla of like wait a minute like something like hit different and i just was like well oops, okay and like it stuck with me it wasn't like a fleeting like well i know i shouldn't do this or i know this is bad for me or i know this is hurting people i would know that and then it would go it would like leave me right because the disease the obsession would kick back in but it would those six weeks before those things weren't leaving me. And then it all culminated in that last moment, like I was saying, after drinking for a day and a half. And then during COVID, I'd say was my other major, major spiritual awakening, which then sparked all the work, the book and my podcast, everything that I'm doing now. And it was also, I also knew that this was going to be good. I remember saying to my husband, something big is happening here. There's a big shift in the the energy, and the, like this consciousness, like you, you mentioned that word before, that 100%, I believe COVID kick-started that, really woke a lot of people up. Um, and I spent a lot of time alone in nature that year. So again, my husband, 9-11 first responder, he has resp chronic respiratory illness. So COVID for us was serious. I don't, you know, I think they made a too big a deal out of it for like a healthy person, but like for people that were at risk, mm -hmm. we, you know, it was serious. So our kids were home, they were e-learners for that year. And, um, we needed a break, my husband and I. So we would, and he's home. My husband's retired. He's retired FDNY. So um, I would go out like every other Friday. I would have like my time, my day off. And every other Friday he would have his day off. And we would go. I, I went by myself. I started researching places in Colorado. There's so many beautiful places to explore here. And I had heard about all these places I'd never been to. So I just made a list and I started checking them off every Friday that I would go out. And um, I just, I was also working the 12 steps of um, ACA, Adult Children of Alcoholic Dysfunctional Family. And I would take my workbook and I would go out into nature and I just felt so connected to something so much greater than me that was in me. Like when I had, when I talked to you, when I explained about being nine years sober and having that moment of meditation where this being came out and gave me its light, that was... Um, the first time that I was able to take this God or whatever I knew of and believed in that was out there and bring it inside. 
that was like the my first experience with that, that this thing is in me. They talk about that a lot. There's like scripture here and there, but religion doesn't, traditional religion doesn't really drive that fact home that we are, I call big G, little G, that we are little G's. Like God is in us, right? They say the hands and the feet, you know, you will do, uh, I, I, you will do more than me. You, you're, you know, the, it's, it's in us. And so in COVID that, that really solidified a lot. And I was reading a lot of different books and I loved it because I had so much time to just really meditate, really go deep to this deeper place and spend time there, right? Like I find 30 minutes, 45 minutes of meditation is like really my sweet spot. Like I could feel good after maybe like 15, 20, but like it, it, it just brings me to this next place. I just go deeper and deeper, higher and higher, however, whatever way you want to look at it in, in, in go, I go more further in and in. So that spiritual awakening happened um, that kickstarted everything for me was this just deep knowing that God is in me and that I do have power. Right. I think there's this big notion that we're so powerless, we're powerless, or especially in religions, it's like God is everything and I am nothing. Right. That's a that's a thing. And or without God, I'm nothing, you know, and yes, I need God and and I am nothing. However, but I but I am not truly nothing. I he gave me this body. My higher self chose to come back on planet Earth this time as Amanda McCoy Flanagan with my painful experiences, my joyful experiences to shine that light of God, that light of love. It's like you said, it's all just love. And if I could get out of my own way, you know, long enough to just let that love guide me and be that motivating force rather than my own ego or my own fear, which is same thing, um, then, then I can do, I can do that. I could do what I'm supposed to do here. So I just want people to know that that's in you too. That's in every single person that is breathing right now, whether you judge them as good or bad or whatever, we are all children of God and we are all little gods and we are all put here to do that work of being love. It's the whole deal. Yes. It says the kingdom of God is within you and also, um, God is within you. She will not fail. There's a lot of different verses in the Bible sure. that actually say that. And even Jesus himself said that, you know, I'm coming back, but really, I don't think he's coming back. Yeah, it's, yes, it's, yes. It's us in yes. that Christ consciousness as a collective yes. coming back together, changing the earth to 5D or new earth, whatever you want to call it. Yep. And so yep. I totally agree. Exactly. Whatever you're saying is everything I'm thinking and been experiencing and feeling and that our audience needs to know these things because yes. I don't think they know. And that's why I'm so grateful for your podcast, for your book, uh, for you to share your message and all of the guests that have been on my podcast. I, I am so grateful that we're, we're getting the message out there. We're, yes. Amanda, we're getting the message out we there. Are. We are. <laughs> we are. We are. You know, and I have like a beef kind of with like social media and technology. I don't love it because of, you know, how detrimental it can be. Yeah. But because of, of this technology, we're able to get these messages out. And there are so many people who are doing this work. So thank you for doing this work and for giving a voice to this truth. This is, this is truth that we are ready for. And we really don't have, you know, I don't want to be like a fear monger, but like the time is now. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to say time is running out, but the time is now we're ready. We are ready to step into this new 5D experience where love is going to lead and compassion and forgiveness and understanding and connection is going to lead rather than the greed and the envy and the fear and the ego. Like it's here. It's ready. So thank you all out there who are listening, who are doing this work and who are believe and who are interested because it's going to set us all free. Yes. And the concept of self-love, we were just talking about there earlier, that plays a crucial role in our healing. Um, I want to ask you, what does self-love mean to you and how do you practice it daily? It means letting myself off the hook for <laughs> you know, having this like immense self-compassion for my humanness really is really what it comes down to. Um, yeah, I mean, I do all the things, the self-love on the outside, the self-care, right? Exercising, eating healthy. Um, it's balance in my work life, my work, you know, my my friends, hanging out with my friends, seeing my friends, being with my children, spending time with my husband. It's really filling up like 
the um the pie chart basically me and my kids talk about the pie chart like when that ooh, when they ever when they think that like I'm doing too much I'm working too much or I'm just not or you know um, I'm not spending enough time which I I do but my kids always want always want more right the kids always want more I I like pull out the pie chart you know we talk about the pie chart and it's like well mommy needs this part to feel fulfilled like I need to feel like I am living purposefully and so it's trying to manage and balance is sort of elusive. I'm not sure balance really is even a thing, but it's something that I strive for. Um, just doing, you know, stuff that feels authentic to me, really going places with people and doing things that really light me up inside and keep bringing me closer and closer to that source energy and keep continuing to wake me up. So it's just, it's reading, reading things that are, are bringing me to that place. I don't watch a lot of TV. Um, I definitely don't watch the news. I don't, I don't, I, I get my news through like people that tell me things. My husband will tell me things. He watch reads the Wall Street Journal online. Like he'll tell me things, but like I try to stay in high frequency energy. That's when I check myself like throughout the day. And when I'm going down, like I have bad, I'm dealing with some hormonal issues right now. I don't know if you're at that stage of your life yet, but I'm dealing with that. And I try to just remind myself, it's just hormones. It's just, even, like when I was active and I was doing drugs <clears throat> and I would believe the things I would just, it's just the drug, Amanda. It's just the drug. It's not real. So when I have these hormones or I have these episodes or these moments where I'm not my best, I just tell myself, it's just the hormones, Amanda. It's just circumstantial. This too shall pass, right? And I give myself grace. I try not to force it too much. I'll take a bath. I'll try to move a muscle, change a thought, you know, something like that when I'm in that bad place. But um, always, I always come back by meditation, the prayer, the exercise. Like I said, I might be off for a couple of days here and there, but something always motivates me to come back. So I just listen to that nudge and I do what it tells me to do. Yes, yeah, because when mom's happy in the household, everybody's happy in the household. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I exactly. tell my kids, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go heal myself. So I'm checked out for a little while. You guys are good. Read a book. Okay, do some chores. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Give me about half hour. I'll be right out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I loved our conversation. Amanda, where can our listeners find your book, find you on social media? I know we just talked about social media online, yeah. uh, all that, all the good stuff. Yeah. I used my social, I was really resistant and I took this course, it's called the conscious marketer. And it helped me to understand that I could use my platform as a way to get these healing messages out, not be like salesy or whatever, you know, but just to like do good, do more good. So um, I'm on Instagram. Everything is at Amanda McCoy Flanagan. It's McCoy with a K. I'm sure it'll be in the in the description, the notes or whatever. Um, so I'm usually on Instagram, Facebook, and then my website. You could find my podcast there or my podcast is Soul Rising, S-O-L Rising. Uh, that's on YouTube, uh, Apple, Spotify, basically anywhere that you get your podcasts. I write a blog on my website. I'm also starting to, in November, I'm starting up my business of a, a certified intuitive grief coaching. So um, all of what we're talking about is going to be part of um, the the program, if you will, of it's three months or, or six month plans of um, helping you move from functioning in your grief to highly functioning to where we're moving from pain into purpose, um, making meaning from grief to gratitude, all that kind of stuff. So if you're stuck and it's been a little bit, at least a year post loss, and you're looking to move into the next chapter of your life and try to understand and figure out what that looks like. I'm your girl. If you like me, <laughs> if you don't like me, find somebody else, but um, I will be offering that in November. That's amazing. And no, I'm sure everyone loves you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you already. Everyone's going to like you, Amanda. Amanda. I love you too. Thank you. But finally, what message do you hope readers take away from trust yourself to be all in? And what steps can someone take today to start fostering a safer relationship with love and letting go? So I didn't mention, so my book, you can find that on Amazon. You can also go to my website and find it there. And um, the quote that I have on there and the quote that I write a lot in the, in the book, in the front of the book when I sign it is, allow yourself to be loved when you hurt, then allow yourself to become love and then go love others. Mm -hmm. So those are sort of the three steps, I think, to my own emotional freedom. Um I could start with with my book or just tap in, just listen, just get quiet for a minute and say, 
Where do I need to go? Who do I need to talk to? Right. God speaks through people to me. Uh, what books should I read? And just like magic, something's going to appear. Something's going to show up and you will be able to start on, on your path. Yes. Beautiful. Any last words or thoughts? Um, I don't, I don't think, I don't think so. I think I've, I think I've said, said everything you, all uh, right. you know, one thing you, you have a duty and an obligation. I have a duty and obligation. I believe we all have a duty and obligation to do this kind of work, um, just to foster a, uh, a more pleasant, uh, society while we're here. I'm, I'm well aware the earth is going to end someday, but while we're here, maybe we can make it a little bit nicer for each other. So I wish you all well. And, um, I, I, I hope that you find the courage to step into your true self because the world needs you. The world needs your shine. Yep, yep. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation today and best of luck with everything you're doing. It's definitely in your purpose and divine purpose and you're doing everything amazing. So thank you. You too. You too, Gina. Thank you so much for having me. Take care.